Hello and welcome. It's Wednesday the 19th of March. You're tuned in to our 10am newscast here on Arirang TV. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Tensions in Ukraine are ratcheting up as a Ukrainian serviceman is killed at a military base in Crimea on the same day that Russian President Vladimir Putin signs a treaty annexing the territory. Korea is calling on Japan to resolve the issue of its sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II to set the right conditions for a bilateral summit. Plus, Korea approves construction of its first foreign-owned casino resort in a bid to attract more tourism spending from China. Our top story this morning, Korea is once again calling on the Japanese government to take sincere and specific actions to resolve the issue of Japan's use of sex slaves during the Second World War. Seoul says this has to happen before a bilateral summit can be held between the two sides. Hwang Sung-hee reports. South Korea called on Japan Tuesday to show its sincerity by resolving the so-called comfort women issue amid speculation of a possible summit between the two neighbors. This follows Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's recent declaration that his government would honor Japan's landmark apology, dubbed the Kono Statement, issued in 1993 to the victims of its wartime sexual enslavement. But South Korean Foreign Ministry spokesperson Cho Taeyang said, words are not enough. The sincere measures that we want to see are steps to resolve the issue. We want to see the comfort women issue being completely resolved. Abe's recent comments had fueled speculation of a possible meeting with his South Korean counterpart at next week's nuclear security summit in The Hague. But Seoul's foreign ministry flatly denied reports that it had begun fine-tuning the details of such a meeting. Since taking office last year, President Park Geun-hye has refused to sit down with Abe, saying she would not meet with a leader who fails to acknowledge his country's historical wrongdoings. The Abe administration has been active in its efforts recently to engage in dialogue with South Korea. With U.S. President Barack Obama set to visit the two countries in April, Washington has been calling on Tokyo to mend ties with Seoul, suggesting it may have been pressure rather than sincerity that drove Abe toward his change in position. Hwang sang Arirang News. North Korea and Japan are set to meet for two days of Red Cross talks in the northeastern Chinese city of Shenyang, starting on this Wednesday. The North's return of the remains of Japanese nationals from the end of World War II will top the agenda at the dialogue, which follows up on a previous round of talks earlier this month. But more attention lies over an informal meeting between foreign ministry officials from the two sides. Japan will likely demand an investigation into North Korea's abduction of Japanese citizens back in the 1970s and 80s. Pyongyang is expected to ask Tokyo to ease sanctions on the regime. Amid signs of thawing relations, North Korea and Japan reopened dialogue two weeks ago for the first time in more than one year. China, a veto-wielding member of the UN Security Council, has shown its intent to block a latest UN panel report on human rights violations inside North Korea. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hong Lei said China opposes politicizing human rights issues and intervening in a country's internal affairs in the name of protecting human rights. This comes after a UN commission on Monday called for international efforts to prosecute the leadership in Pyongyang responsible for rights abuses in the North. Beijing has also come under fire for repatriating North Koreans trying to uh, defect through China. The spokesperson then said the international community should rather focus on maintaining the current diffusion of tensions on the uh, Korean peninsula. Now, to a move that could signal a major sea change for South Korea's tourism industry. For the first time, Korea has opened up its very tightly controlled casino market to a foreign operator. The government hopes the massive casino and entertainment resort near Incheon International Airport will create thousands of new jobs and bring in millions of dollars in tax revenue. Park Ji-won reports. 
The Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism said at a press briefing Tuesday that it has granted approval to the Indonesian Chinese enterprise Lipo Group and U.S.-based Caesars Entertainment to open the casino, which will be for foreigners only. The casino will be located some 50 kilometers west of Seoul on Yeongjongdo Island, which is part of the Incheon Free Economic Zone and the location of Incheon International Airport. The approval is for the first phase of the consortium's plan to develop a high-end resort. Phase one will see construction of two hotels, serviced residences, and a convention center for an estimated cost of roughly 700 million U.S. dollars, and completion is expected in 2018. The entire development is expected to cost over 2 billion U.S. dollars and will be completed by 2023. The Lippo and Caesars Consortium first submitted the proposal to develop the casino resort last year, but the proposal was rejected on the grounds that the plan did not fulfill certain credit rating qualifications. The consortium won approval for the plan after enlarging the size of the investment and submitting suitable credit rating assessments. The approval is only valid when the joint venture successfully implements certain conditions, such as undergoing an annual audit. This decision was made after a thorough evaluation by related ministries, with the goal of boosting the nation's tourism industry. The government expects the casino to boost employment and bring in tax revenue, as well as strengthen the competitiveness of the domestic casino industry. It will be the 17th casino in Korea, 16 of which are exclusively for foreigners. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, amid ongoing political wrangling over a nuclear security-related bill, President Park Geun-hye is calling for its swift ratification. The president, who will attend the nuclear security summit in The Hague next week, stressed it would hurt the international community's confidence in Korea if the bill is not passed before then. Yulian reports. President Park Geun-hye has urged lawmakers to promptly pass a nuclear security bill ahead of our attendance at the 2014 Nuclear Security Summit in the Netherlands next week. The NSS is a biennial gathering of world leaders aimed to prevent nuclear terrorism. At a cabinet meeting Tuesday, President Park expressed regret that the National Assembly has failed to approve legislation related to protecting nuclear materials and preventing nuclear disasters in the two years since Hull hosted the global conference. In the 2012 Hull communique, participating nations had agreed to work toward preventing criminals and terrorists from getting their hands on nuclear materials. <laughs> Both the ruling and main opposition parties agree that the nuclear security legislation is important, but the bill has been held up in the National Assembly due to political wrangling over other issues of contention. The ruling Senate party condemned the main opposition Democratic Party for refusing to pass the urgent bill, calling the move political warfare. It has asked that an extraordinary session of the National Assembly be convened on Thursday, but without the DP's cooperation, the bill is unlikely to pass. The DP says the Senate party is to blame for the impasse because it has refused to pass bills related to the public's livelihood. Yudian, Arirang News. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion Diplomatic tensions between Russia and the West have hit new highs, with the first Ukrainian soldier reportedly being shot dead just hours after Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a treaty to claim Crimea as Russian territory. The United States says the annexation will not be recognized. Connie Lee reports. 
In Moscow, the crowds chanted Russia, Russia. And in Crimea, cheers and applause fill the streets after Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a treaty on Tuesday in front of parliament to make Crimea part of Russia. It is such a momentous day today. We want to say that we are very proud of our President Vladimir Putin. Putin says Russia must now act as Ukraine's new government. And in front of crowds late Tuesday in Moscow's Red Square, he said Crimea has finally returned to its home port to Russia. We have done a lot together, but we will do much more. We will need to solve many tasks, but I know. I'm confident that we will overcome everything, resolve everything, because we are together. Glory to Russia! In Ukraine's capital, Kiev, residents are angry over Putin's latest actions. I want him to stop mocking our people. I want him to stay in Russia and govern the Russians and not touch our people and not torture Ukraine. And tensions heightened into violence on Tuesday when masked gunmen killed one Ukrainian troop, injured another, and arrested some other Ukrainian officials stationed in Crimea. The Ukrainian military has now been ordered to use weapons to protect and preserve the life of Ukrainian soldiers. Meanwhile, Western leaders, including those in the U.S. and Germany, have condemned Putin's actions. We would not recognize this attempted annexation. But it doesn't seem like the Russian president is showing any signs of backing down. Connie Lee, Arirang News. A little closer to home now, and prosecutors have arrested a South Korean intelligence agent on charges of forging documents related to alleged spying activities for North Korea. This is the first time an agent from the National Intelligence Service has been detained in this latest case. The Seoul Central District Court on Wednesday issued an arrest warrant for the agent referred to by his surname Kim for ordering an agency supporter to get a hold of documents that refute claims made by the Chinese police. China's security forces denied issuing China-North Korea border crossing records of Yu Song, a former Seoul City government worker accused of being a North Korean spy. And the agency supporter was later found to forge documents that said the office did in fact issue the records. Kim denies he knew about the forgery, while the supporter alleges the NIS was aware of it. Now, some mixed news for the nation's two leading automakers. On the positive side, the market share of vehicles produced by Hyundai Motor and its affiliate Kia Motors in Europe topped 6% for the first time in four months in February. The European Automobile Manufacturers Association also says Kia Motors sold over 23,000 units, up 8% from the same month last year. It wasn't as good for Hyundai Motor, however. Korea's largest car maker sold just shy of 30,000 units last month. That's actually down around 3.5% on year. Volkswagen Group topped the market share in Europe at over 24%. Now, starting next spring, a clause in the Korea-U.S. free trade deal will kick in. That will allow American firms to own program providers right here in Korea. Some industry insiders have raised concerns that Korea's broadcasting industry may suffer as a result. Our Na Hyung-young reports. Korea is bracing for an era of heated market competition in its broadcasting industry. Come next year, American media groups will be allowed to own program providers or PPs in Korea under the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Pact ratified in 2012. PPs are those that create content or have acquired the right to broadcast taped television and radio programs, for example, terrestrial broadcast stations or cable channels. And to better cope with the upcoming change, officials from the ICT ministry and the Korea Communications Commission put their heads together with industry experts to consider possible negative effects. In order to keep a competitive edge in the rapidly changing environment and competition in the global market, the government came up with a comprehensive plan aimed at improving the nation's broadcasting industry last December. This plan will be fleshed out and finalized by the end of April. Insiders say American media groups have been visiting Korea since late last year to conduct market research and evaluate its potential. But experts in Seoul say U.S. companies making a foray into the domestic market will not likely have an immediate impact in the industry. 
The effects will not be visible in the short run, but because the U.S. dominates the world's content market, we do need a long-term plan. It could work for the better and serve as an opportunity for our contents to set foot into the American market. Officials say the profit structure for the PPs should also be modified so they can focus more on producing creative content rather than relying on commercials. Na hyun Gyeong, Arirang News. Korea has taken another step towards developing its first completely homegrown rocket, slated for completion in six years' time. Korea's space agency and the science ministry announced Tuesday that ground combustion tests for what will be the third stage engine were conducted successfully at the narrow space center in Gohung, Jolanamdo province. The seven-ton thrust engine passed five separate combustion tests designed to check the fuel injection system and engine stability. Korea became the 13th country to launch a space rocket from its own soil in January of last year when it launched the narrow rocket, whose first stage was built by Russian scientists. Now, for a look at some of the international headlines we're following at this hour, we're going to turn to our news center where our Eunice Kim is standing by. And Eunice, the U.S. Federal Open Market Committee is meeting this week under the stewardship of its new chief, Janet Yellen. What are we hearing? That's right, Mark. The Fed's policymaking committee meets Tuesday and Wednesday this week, and we're expected to hear from Janet Yellen at the end of it. What's widely expected is a third round of quantitative tapering. The Fed will likely announce that it will add $10 billion less to its Treasury and mortgage backed securities in April to $55 billion. This given the absence of a huge economic shift in the U.S. Now, what's less clear will be how Yellen will guide the Fed on short-term interest rates against the backdrop of falling U.S. unemployment rates, which at 6.7 percent last month has been dipping faster than expected. The results of the meeting are expected early Thursday morning Korea time, and we will bring it to you then. In other news, investigators begin their 12th day of searching for missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 with very few leads and an even bigger search area. The Malaysian government said Tuesday that the search zone has now been expanded to over 2.24 million square nautical miles, an area roughly the size of Australia. China, with Kazakhstan, will lead the search efforts in the northern corridor, while the southern corridor will be led by Australia. Authorities are trying to piece together patchy data and backtrack the sequence of events. The New York Times reports that senior U.S. officials say the plane's sudden move to the west was likely programmed into the Boeing 777's computer system by someone on board with deep knowledge of it. Meanwhile, patience is running thin for families as the relatives of some Chinese passengers on board are threatening to go on a hunger strike if more information is not provided by Malaysian authorities. The United States has called on Syria to suspend its diplomatic mission in the United States as the civil war in Syria enters its fourth year with little sign of easing. U.S. Special Envoy for Syria Daniel Rubenstein explained it was, quote, unacceptable for persons appointed by the Bashar al-Assad regime to conduct diplomatic operations in the U.S. The order affects the Syrian embassy in Washington as well as its consulates. Strides toward a peace settlement for Syria look dim as relations between its main brokers, the U.S. and Russia, are worsening. And the most important meal of the day is getting costlier. The Financial Times reports that costs of eight key breakfast commodities, coffee, orange juice, milk, wheat, sugar, butter, cocoa and pork, have risen nearly 25 percent this year on the back of rising demand and global uncertainties. Unseasonably dry weather in Brazil has caused coffee to jump more than 70 percent, while wheat prices have increased due to a prolonged extreme winter in the U.S., as well as the conflict in Ukraine, which is a key grain producer country.
And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off in figure skating where the Korea Skating Union and the Korea Olympic Committee continues to fight the judges scoring during the figure skating event in Sochi. But time is running out. Despite the KSU and the KOC trying to convince the International Olymp Com Olympic Committee and the International Skating Union, little progress has been made. And with the rules stating that anyone is given 30 days for a chance to change the results, there are now only two days left. And despite the number of petitions and even a newspaper ad, chances are the results will stand. And speaking of which, Russia's Adelina Sotnikova, who won the quote-unquote controversial gold medal during the figure skating event, will not be competing in the upcoming World Championships in Japan. With the World Championships taking place from the 24th to the 30th of this month, the Russian figure skater confirmed that she will not be competing. But she added that it was not her decision, but her coach's decision, so that she may prepare for next season. Now, many experts questioned her decision, with some even stating that she's not confident in scoring as high as she did in Sochi. And now shifting over to football, where the Tekuk Warriors failed to earn top seed for the upcoming Asian Cup in Australia for the first time in 31 years. With four Asian nations giving the top seed, the 60th-ranked South Korea failed to earn a spot as the top seed. With Iran ranked 42nd, Japan at 48th, and Uzbekistan at 55th, Korea should have been given the last top seed. But the rule stating that the host nation is giving an automatic top seed, the 63rd-ranked Australia was giving the last top seed as Korea faces a tough road, with the event taking place in January of next year. And staying with football, we had two K-League Classic teams playing the AFC Champions League group stage matches last night as the Puang Steelers drew against Shandong Luneng 2-2 after giving up two penalties in the first half. Meanwhile, the Jumbo County Motors struggles against Guangzhou Evergrande, losing 3-1 despite the Lion King Lee dong -gu getting on the score sheet for Jumbo. And now with that finishing things off with Game 4 of the KBL First Round Playoff Series between the KT Sonic Boom and Incheon Etilan Elephants. Of course, going into the game here, KT off to a great start as they take a 21-17 lead before Incheon rallies in the second quarter as they take a slim 29-28 lead going into halftime. Both teams neck and neck throughout the second half, but with Ricardo Powell posting up 24 points and 10 rebounds, the Incheon Etilan Elephants hold on to force a decisive Game 5 with a 72-66 win. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, you might want to dress warmer today. We have some a chilly day ahead of us. Highs will drop into low to mid-teens across the regions. And clouds will continue to grow during the day. So due to cloud coverage, it could feel chillier than actual numbers. And this morning, most regions started out with relatively high level of yellow dust. But right now, as we can see, lingering dust are only be seen in the western parts of the peninsula. So it's gradually going away and the air quality should return to normal by this afternoon. And tomorrow there will be showers in a short period around the country and temperatures will stay on the cool side till the rest of the work week. But it looks like it's going to spike to warm side on the weekend. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The afternoon highs will rise to 13 in Seoul and Daegu will top out at 15 while Gwangju and Busan should get up to 14 later in the day. Now for other regions, it looks like down on Jeju and Daejeon will climb up to 15, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be at 2 this afternoon. Well, that's all for me at this hour, and hope you have a wonderful day.
And that's all for now. We'll be back again at noon Korea time. In the meantime, you can catch up with what's been happening on our website, arirang.co.kr forward slash news.